so uh, let's, uh, let's start. Uh, I am Gilles Favarel Garrigue, uh, and I am very happy to uh, introduce today the, the second uh, seminar of the seminar series on political repression in Russia. Uh, and this seminar is done here in uh, L'Ecole des Hautes Études en Sciences Sociales with uh, CEPSEC and also with uh, L'Archipel and uh, uh, OVD Info. Um, this uh, this seminar today is about collecting, uh, is, is named From Arrest to Trial, Collecting and Analyzing Data on Political Repression in an Authoritarian Context, and uh, from uh, 2011 to 2022. Um, this is the first part of a two-part seminar about data and political repression, uh, which uh, will be presented by uh, uh, OVDN for today. The second one will deal with this data after the launching of the Russian full-scale invasion in Ukraine. So this is why today we will uh, uh, end in uh, 2022, and uh, we will not deal with uh, political repression after the start of uh, uh, the full-scale invasion in Ukraine. And uh, I have also to mention that the date of the second seminar has, has changed. It will be held on Thursday, December 21, at 4.30 uh, uh, at 4 p.m. on Paris time. It will be online and offline in another room here, which will be mentioned afterwards. But it's not uh, exactly the date that was mentioned in the beginning uh, on the program. So. Uh, be careful with that, and uh, keep in mind that the next session will be on December 21 uh, at 4.30 p.m. Uh, I will say a few words about political repression before the full-scale invasion in Ukraine, and uh, Renata Mustafina, which, who is uh, online, uh, will, uh, will follow up with that. So uh, it's uh, just a few words to say that political uh, repression has obviously increased since the beginning of the 2010s, and especially after mass protestations against electoral frauds in 2011-2012. Uh, and uh, when we think about political repression in the 2010s in Russia, there are a lot of uh, tragic, uh, tragic events uh, which come and which spring to mind immediately. The Balotnaya trial, uh, which Renata Mustafina has investigated, the assassination of Boris Nemtsov, of course, the harassment of pro Navalny supporters, et cetera, et cetera. And there is a long story of uh, political repression during this decade. And uh, what I would like to, to, to mention here in the introduction is that political repression as a policy, as a state policy, raises important issues of definition. Important issues of definition, and uh, for instance, about its targets and about its modus operandi how to circumscribe, for instance, the perimeter of political repression. First, about the targets. Of course, when we think about political repression, we often think first of liberal option, of NGOs, of civil society. But there was an issue very important in Russia in the 2010s about should we include in the list ultra-nationalist in the discussion? And NGOs have discussed these issues during the 2010s and it's important to keep it in mind. What is the definition of the good political prisoner or of the bad political prisoner? What do, well, who do we include in uh, political repression? And it's especially important in Russia as there were several waves of repression targeting ultra-nationalist leaders and especially in the early 2010s. And we have the same situation about elite representatives being members of the pro-presidential majority, who suddenly, after having been loyal to the regime, are targeted for corruption cases. And here I have a name in mind. It's the name of Alexander Shestun. Mm -hmm. Alexander Shestun used to be a member of United Russia. He was a perfect uh, uh, disciple of, uh, uh, of the, the leaders of uh, United Russia, but he became a, re a rebel and tried to find super, uh, popular support in his crusade against presidential administration. And uh, there were debates, I believe, uh, in Memorial about it. And he became a political prisoner, according to Memorial, in 2021. And that's a very interesting case. If we think about political repression, 
because of course it uh, enlarges definition of what we usually see as good or bad, or as good <laughs> political prisoners. The second thing I wanted to say is about the modus operandi of political repression. Political repression is not only judicial, but also extrajudicial. Since the beginning of the 2010, physical and digital forms of harassment of opponents have spread. Pro regime vigilantes or auxiliary groups as Nord, Serb, Anti Maidan have gained visibility. There are a lot of facts of extrajudicial violence, and they are important to understand the pressure exerted on political opponents during demonstrations, but also in everyday life. And it's important to mention it because we see that after the launching of full scale invasion in 2022, this form of political repression is also activated. Uh, the last point uh, uh, I would like to mention is the connection between what, uh, what we do between political repression, police, and judicial activities. In fact, when we see the Russian case, other auxiliaries of the state uh, are involved in political repression and may, may be found, for, for instance, in universities or in high schools. During demonstrations uh, launched by Navalny in 2017 and 18, huge efforts were devoted to discourage young people mm -hmm. from participating uh, in demonstrations involving teachers, university administration, high school administrations, and discouraging people uh, to take part in pacifist, uh, pac uh, peaceful demonstrations is also part of political repression. So it's just a few challenges uh, that uh, come to my mind when I think about political repression. And I will give the floor to uh, Renata Mustafina. Uh, thank you very much, Gilles, for this introduction, and uh, thank you again to everyone for coming to the seminar and for the of the info team to to uh, continue uh, putting a lot of like effort and um, work into this uh, into this uh, seminar. So uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things about the um, um, about the bifurcated system um, of. So bifurcated repressive system of protest management, and then I will um, uh, say a few words about the criminalization of protest and how we understand it. And uh, and then my last point will be about the very category of political prisoner and political prosecution that we will be using throughout this uh, seminar. So uh, I, we usually think, I mean, this, the, the scholarship in the US and the scholarship in, in Europe on the Persecutions against protesters, uh, uh, it tends to to imagine these persecutions as criminal mostly. But in Russia, there is this uh, bifurcated repressive system of protest management, and there are two repressive tracks where we have, on one hand, uh, administrative detentions, uh, which rely mainly on police, and they function as a mode of social control by dissuading into individuals from further protests. So the, there is this like detention at the site of protest, then it is followed by the ride in the police bus, and, and then there is the, the further processing of a, of a person uh, at a police precinct. And this is certainly a repressive experience, but it can also be lived by protesters as an exciting experience of, of togetherness as, and of shared politicization. Uh, but unlike administrative track, the criminal repressive track is more uh, punitively oriented. So it, vo it involves the work of many repressive institutions, investigative bodies, uh, prosecutor's office and, and courts. I mean, administrative detentions, they also end up in courts. But uh, uh, what I'm trying to say is that it, in this case, it entangles, entangles protesters in the tentacles of the criminal justice system. And it means that the person who was prosecuted for, for a criminal protest related criminal offense will always have this criminal record. And this is something to keep in mind. And during the 2010s, almost every big protest was accompanied by both hundreds of cases of administrative offenses and dozens of criminal uh, prosecutions. Uh, but when we speak about the criminalization of protest in Russia, uh, there are two components here. So there is like there is one thing that happens at the level of the law enforcement and at the level of the, the practices of law enforcement on the ground. So the, the majority of people will be tried for minor non-criminal administrative offenses. But in the last decades, almost every big protest ended with like this crim criminal uh, cases on 
charges of use of violence against police officers and in some cases on charges of mass rights. And Gilles uh, mentioned uh, the Bolotne Square trial. So this was the, the biggest uh, the biggest trial where uh, people were tried on charges of participation in mass rights. But there is also the criminalization of protest at the level of legislation. So uh, I, I just spoke about like these two repressive tracks and in 2000s they were clearly distinct but the 2014 legislation it created the bridge between the code of administrative offenses and the code of criminal offenses which penalized repetitive protest and blurred the boundary between what what has been like two distinct uh, repressive tracks and um finally my my last point is uh, is that like these protest related prosecutions, they all, of course account for only one share of political prosecutions and uh, databases need uh, categories and they need categories such as uh, political prisoner, such as a political prosecution, uh, because they are useful and we need to work with uh, with this data and, and engage with it. But uh, they're also tricky as they hide uh, complex realities, complex repressive assemblages and practices. And when we're speaking about political prosecutions, we do not cover the everyday violence that touches thousands unknown people brought in for drug use or embezzlement or for theft or even for, for terrorism. And um, I, I, I won't just wanted to reiterate here that any operation of inclusion is an operation of exclusion too. And by constituting a database, we certainly leave aside certain cases, which by by this very gesture of constituting a database, we do not have the they these cases do not have the right to be discussed as political. And I just think that we should be mindful of that. And by speaking about political prosecutions, we mean that there are like non-political mundane prosecutions. And here we are running the risk of kind of reifying this binary political and non-political uh, cases. So to a certain extent, any unlawful prosecution can be analyzed as a political one too, but it is a, it is a metaphor for other discussion. I just wanted to say that, thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I give the floor to, to Daniel to start the seminar. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, I think we will um, return to this uh, not uh, today and uh, during other seminars as well. I'm sorry, I have to start the uh, yeah. presentation just. Great, great. Okay, um, so um, welcome to our second uh, <laughs> presentation. And today, uh, today, um, last time we were presenting a project over the but today we are starting to uh, present our specific data sets. Uh, these are the data on uh, politically motivated uh, uh, detentions and criminal uh, prosecution. Both of these uh, data sets are in periods up until the beginning of the full scale invasion. It is not actually a usual conversation for us since we just published this week significant updates of uh, of, of these uh, data sets. So, uh, uh, the work which we have prepared, it was the work which we prepared during uh, many months, and today it will be a first presentation of uh, this uh, work full of uh, experimental uh, features. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we would like to divide our presentation today in three parts. Uh, first, we will continue a bit on what we um, uh, 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 speaking about. Um, we will speak shortly about um, the political repression in general, about the problems of uh, definition of this term in context of Russia, and about our uh, specific uh, uh, optics of uh, what they for. Um, so um, then we will present both of these uh, data sets which I just uh, mentioned. So uh, my colleagues today, uh, 
Daria Kralenko from the other uh, side of the screen and the Gorilla work who is here. Both of them are working with the data in our project and they will be speaking today in this you know, presentation. Uh, so, obviously, there are various definitions of what is uh, political uh, uh, repression. Some of them are focused on participation in the political life, some on violation of uh, civil liberties uh, in human rights and human rights. But uh, in context of Russia, it is very, very important to understand that uh, uh, systematic violation of uh, international uh, norms and conventions <clears throat> during the uh, investigation and trial is rather a regular practice than the exception. So, uh, um, with this definition, uh, the list of political prisoners will become enormously uh, large. Therefore, uh, we have to find the other means to uh, identify the political nature of the case by studying closely uh, the context and possible political uh, motives of uh, authorities. By this uh, term, political uh, motive, we mean desire of the authority or the representatives to eliminate in any way either a political uh, opponent or a person peacefully defending any political, social, religious ideas and principles, as well as fighting against any actions of the uh, authority. But as uh, we discussed last time, and as uh, we already discussed today, um, uh, even this definition becomes very, very problematic in the context of uh, the war and systematic attempts by the state to uh, intimidate society. Uh, the question of definition is a key in all disputes about political repression in Russia, but in the, in the end, it comes down to who and how is evaluating the cases. At ODP, we prefer to answer this question in the context of specific data sets. So we'll come back to this question uh, today at least twice. <laughs> um, before going further to specific data, it's worth to spend a couple of minutes and try to categorize uh, and uh, um, categorize a repression in Russia. Um, again, here I'm trying to present uh, the view uh, optics of uh, uh, ordained for, because um, uh, it is a very subjective uh, question. And, uh, but it will help us to explain why we are talking about this data and why we are not talking about uh, other data. Um, so, the criminal prosecutions are the most obvious type of political repression. These are the cases of persecution which are accommodated by the most severe sanctions, primarily those involving the creation of liberty. Uh, these types of cases uh, we, uh, we, we can divide uh, into few uh, uh, intersected groups. First of all, uh, these are uh, first of all these are the articles of criminal code which we are considering purely political. So basically everyone who, uh, who is uh, charged with uh, charged with this uh, thing, we consider automatically uh, a political uh, case. These are offenses related to foreign agents law, laws, uh, to undesirable organization, to the discretion of uh, the army or government uh, bodies. Uh, these are fake news, calls for sanctions, uh, violation of uh, the conduct of, uh, um, of uh, gatherings, which Renato yeah. mentioned. The other group is uh, religious persecutions, then mm -hmm. uh, cases related to uh, connections with uh, undesirable people. Sorry, I have to say this word, but that's not related to undesirable yeah. organizations. Okay. People, uh, like the cases we see around Navalny, around FBK, around Open Russia, and, uh, other uh, entities. Cases related to statements, whatever statements are against authorities or against war, against military glory, or against religion. And cases related to more mass uh, action. 
it is important, however, to, to mention that uh, the nature of the case can be very different from uh, open. For example, we are aware of application of more than 60 different criminal articles in the context of persecutions related to anti Um Next type is administrative persecutions, which consists of the cases of unlawful accusation of an administrative offense on uh, political motives. Uh, the focus of attention is um, on the cases of persecution with the most severe sanctions, primarily involved in creation of liberty, I was saying before. But Russian legislation provides, for the, provides the possibility of uh, long-term imprisonment only for criminal charges. So the stories of uh, people who are subjected to administrative pressure inevitably remain remains in the shadow. Uh, the focus on criminal cases in practice uh, prevents us from understanding how widespread administrative repression has been uh, in the last decade in Russia and its role uh, in creating the uh, atmosphere of fear uh, in the society which very, which is very well represented today. In reality, the line between criminal and administrative persecution is becoming increasingly narrow. Uh, so fines for administrative offenses have increased significantly during the last decade. For example, maximum penalty for a rally participant has increased from 25 euros to 3,500, 140 times. Uh, the number of offences for which you can get administrative arrests up to 30 days has also increased, as well as their application in practice. Today, it's becoming common practice uh, for people to be detained on the way out of special detention centres for administrative uh, detainees to be tried and sent back to a special uh, detention centre. This method is often used before the initiation of criminal proceedings and further uh, deprivation of uh, liberty already as a preventive manner uh, inside the criminal case. Finally, it's uh, worth noting that the legislative practice of introducing criminal liability for repeated administrative offenses, what Renato was mentioning, uh, appeared in 2014. Um, it is uh, now, it is began to be actively used in replacing laws after the beginning of uh, the full um, scale invasion uh, of Russia uh, into Ukraine. Administrative uh, persecution of organization of files uh, falls into the same group of administrative uh, repression. This is the way how many NGOs and media outlets are persecuted in modern Russia. Finally, the same group includes uh, cases of deportation, which is also sometimes uh, used for political reasons. Uh, Extra uh, judicial persecutions, which uh, uh, was uh, mentioned, consist from our view of a wide range of practices intended to prevent uh, individuals uh, from engaging in political or social uh, activities without criminal or administrative uh, proceedings against this person. These practices uh, include uh, um, purely <laughs> criminal uh, practices such as threats, destruction of property, assault, and uh, murder, and um, institutional practices, which um, is then um, and, uh, uh, enforcement, uh, enforcement agencies uh, use their powers uh, and uh, some other uh, various officials. Uh, for example, threats to take away uh, children from uh, guardianship, pressure on businesses, dismissal from work, expulsion from universities or other educational institutions, cancellation of uh, concert, lectures, films, and other types of events, forced um, apologies on camera, and other types of uh, demonstration of uh, loyalty uh, to the regime that. Uh, who are uh, after position statements. We also include here uh, various types of uh, pressure in place of uh, deprivation of liberty and um, any other methods of uh, pressure that do not have a legal uh, basis or precedent. 
Uh, extrajudicial uh, persecution is an incredibly broad concept, and due to its uh, specific nature, it's practically impossible to monitor it on a regular basis. Nevertheless, uh, reports of uh, such persecutions are very um, important background to Russian social and political life, and the possibility of encountering them in practice has a uh, significant impact uh, on this society. Finally, uh, I want to mention uh, another type of persecution, which is related to the different, to the registers of uh, various uh, governmental agents. This includes blocking content on the internet, lists of extremist materials, registers of extremist organizations, foreign agents, uh, undesirable. <laughs> Being on this uh, register significantly increases increasing the likelihood of administrative or criminal proceedings against uh, individuals and uh, organizations. The data that allow us to perform quantitative uh, analysis of this uh, phenomena can be divided into several categories. It is uh, Judicial statistics of Supreme Court. It is uh, the data on judgments that courts are obliged to publish. It is uh, legis uh, legislative and re regulatory data on <laughs> federal and regional level. And uh, these uh, institutional registers, uh, which I just uh, mentioned on foreign agents, and civil organizations, etc. And uh, finally, it is uh, of course, monitoring uh, data of different <laughs> human rights organizations on uh, And just to uh, uh, explain why I put here this, uh, sorry, this picture, uh, it is um, um, a, a screenshot from uh, a project which, which is called Forbidden Territory. And it shows how you apply quantitative uh, analysis to the regional legislature. So uh, here it is the map of uh, Nizhny Novgorod and uh, the places where you cannot uh, uh, protest mm -hmm. within this uh, mm -hmm. uh, city. So uh, finally, I would like to say uh, what we are doing with all of this uh, data. It is exactly the subject uh, of seminars. And within uh, uh, seminars in February and March, we will talk about the ways of uh, making state judicial data more accessible. And generally, we will present how uh, supplement supplementary registers with uh, additional data allow us to analyze impacts of foreign engine uh, and undesirable uh, organization concepts. And today, a bit uh, uh, later, we will focus on criminal persecution. And now I I would like to pass uh, my perform to my colleague Derek, who will present the results of collecting the data on uh, persecution related to execution rights on uh, freedom of assent. Yeah, please. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you everyone for coming and thanks for such uh, comprehensive introductions from you and Renata. Um, Next slide, please. I think it will be better. Yeah, so uh, I will talk about one of our main data sets, actually about the first ever data we ever started collecting. Uh, as you probably already know, if you attended the last seminar, uh, of the info started collecting data from the very first day of our existence, uh, because the project emerged in December 2011 with the large scale balloting protests. So the first ever data we collected was the data about the detentions. Uh, and it continued. Uh, we continued to monitor the actions uh, and the detentions of this on these actions. So uh, the first data set was published together with the, our very first report in early 2013. Uh, and it contained data on detentions in Moscow from the start of our work, December 2011, to the end of 2012. The next report uh, in two, uh, that covered the 2013 and the data set included data on detentions in St. Petersburg, Nizhny Novgorod, and Voronezh, 
uh, not only in Moscow, because these were the cities at the time that were quite politically active. Uh, in 2020, we, uh, we published consolidated data on detentions up to 2019 uh, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. So we, throughout all of these years, every year we collected this data and uh, summarized it, analyzed it and used it for uh, various analytical purposes. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, as we already mentioned, uh, we, uh, in this November, for the very first time, published uh, the data on public actions with detentions in them for the period from December 2011 up to the end of 2021. Uh, it's quite a big deal for us, because, especially because the 2021 was uh, one of the biggest year in terms of protest and freedom of assembly in Russia. Uh, that's why it was quite challenging for us, but I think I will focus on that later on. Uh, this data set covers uh, the Moscow and St. Petersburg since 2013, and all of the Russian regions included annexed Crimea uh, since 2020, and it's available both in Russian and uh, English languages. Uh, next slide. Um, I want to focus a bit on why do we focus so much on the data about the detentions and uh, what does it give to us. Firstly, I think it's quite important to know that it's one of the sources of the knowledge about how the system of civil rights violations in Russia was organized and developed because uh, this data shows us not only uh, how many people were detained, but it also shows us what, what kinds of actions uh, the people participated in, how the actions uh, gradually went from the allowed by the state, and you can get an agreement for the action if it's not, if it's about, say, it's ecology or some social problems to the complete elimination of the right to freedom of assembly in Russia. Uh, so uh, it's quite evident, especially in the dynamics. And it is, of course, one of the sources of knowledge about the history of civic protest in Russia, because, uh, as I will say later on, uh, the data set also includes, uh, for instance, the information about the main actors that organizes, organized the actions, uh, who, was, who was detained, uh, topics of the actions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So to sum up, uh, I think it, uh, this data uh, is one of the key resources to analyze how the repressions in Russia gradually uh, began to grow since 2011. Uh, next slide, please. Um, how do we determine the political motive for detention? Uh, because it uh, differs a bit from the political motive of a criminal case, uh, as my colleagues will later on explain. Uh, one of the uh, main things we focus on is the circumstances of the detention. So if the person was detained at a political action, be it an assembly, be it a single picket, be it uh, some kind of a performative event, uh, it is political. Uh, if it's an activist who is detained while, for instance, campaigning for elections or putting up posters or performing some other kind of public action, and uh, if it's an unmotivated detention of a person known for his or her political or social activism, because in Russia, um, one of the quite often used reasons for detention is the disobedience for a police officer. Uh, which can be uh, a completely arbitrary reason. And uh, to see a political motive here, we try to uh, analyze what is, who is the person is. For instance, Ilya Yashin was detained for disobedience for a political officer, which is not a polit political reason per se. Uh, also, politics here are interpreted in the broad sense of defending one's rights and interests. So we include uh, as a political mot motive, for instance, events that focus on the environment, uh, on the housing rights, or any other social problems, uh, medical care, you name it, uh, LGBTQ plus rights, uh, et cetera. Because, um, uh, because as the data set shows, uh, it's gradually all this, uh, topics gradually became more and more political in the view of the Russian 
state of the Russian government, especially LGBTQ rights and, uh, and uh, social problems. Uh, so if in other countries that would not be considered quite political, in Russia it is because the very right of the protest uh, was eliminated. Next slide. Uh, what, what do I mean when I say action? Uh, it can be different types of public events, and we call and uh, sounds, sounds better, better in Russia. Russia. Uh, yeah, so first it's a public event, for example, protests, street events, rallies, uh, and uh, other kinds of mass assemblies, marches, picket lines, uh, you name it. Uh, another type of the action is some public events uh, like lecture, festival, performance, concert, even uh, if they do not talk, take place in the streets. This can be, for instance, the evenings of the letters to the political prisoners, and other events that are organized by the civic activists. And political campaigning, uh, handing out the leaflets, putting up the posters with some independent candidates, uh, just uh, putting out the agitation cubes. Uh, it was quite a popular form of the uh, campaigning uh, in 2010s in Russia. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically uh, any, any kind of the any kind of the public events, no matter where it, where it is held. Yep, next slide. Um, the data set has this limitation. For instance, we do not include uh, in this particular data set uh, the arrest or detention in a criminal or administrative case, even if it is related to activists, to activists' political views or activity, uh, because the criminal cases are held differently. And in terms of administrative, uh, we started to monitor them later on in 2022, but I think it will be the topic of uh, uh, the next seminar. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. Uh, the data in the database uh, describe each role, uh, describes an action at which detention took place. Uh, it also contains objective data, which describes the action. Uh, what type is it, uh, where, when, and where it was held, et cetera. I will focus on, on the next slide. And subjective categorization, which we, um, yeah, well, thank you, Daniel. Uh, so uh, objective data contains the uh, date of the action, uh, descriptive title for the action, uh, overview of the events and the causes for detentions. Uh, if the event was authorized by regional authorities or not, the topic of the authorization and how the Russia, how it became gradually harder and harder uh, next to impossible in Russia to authorize an action is uh, quite a big topic of our research and this data perfectly demonstrates it uh, because uh, it, it was also used to prove that the legislation of, of on event authorization was gradually worsened until it became as bad as nowadays. Uh, Going back, uh, it's the objective data also contains community or organization that organized the action, uh, how many people were detained, uh, approximate location of the place of the detention, police stations to which the detainees were taken, and reference to the source of information. It's usually the link to uh, news or some other material on our website. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, subjective categorization is uh, the thing that we did to better analyze the objective data. So it's it's some categories we developed by ourselves and analyze the data. Uh, you can see them on the screen. Uh, subjective categorization has the action format. So for instance, if it is a rally, if it is a picket, if it is uh, some kind of performative action. Uh, it includes level of demand, uh, for instance, uh, what, uh, what do the protesters want and uh, how, uh, what, what level are their demands? So is it a local protest regarding deforestation or is it a federal protest demanding the release of the political prisoners? Uh, it's the subject of the action, mm -hmm. so it's the main topic of the action, and you can see on the uh, 
bottom on the bottom right of the screen, for instance, the main subjects of the actions uh, throughout the years, political prisoners, corruption, uh, foreign policy, etc. It contains type of organizer, so whether it's some civil society organization, whether the protest was spontaneous, or whether it's some group of uh, local activists that organized the protests. And it also contains a story. It's a brief description of the reasons uh, for which participants protested. Uh, sometimes it includes what the inscriptions of the pl placards read, etc. So some kind of descriptive, uh, descriptive role. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, to analyze the data, uh, you can use the local source CSV data. Uh, you can use the data visualization on our website. We uh, we have the visualization. We just haven't published it yet, but it will be published, I hope, uh, in the near future. And also a computational notebook with tools for data sets, aggregation and analysis. And I don't know, Daniel, if you want to elaborate on this notebook. No, I think we should uh, go with the Okay. Video. Okay. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and a, a little bit about the accuracy. It's uh, that our data for sure cannot be taken as an absolutely accurate description of what happened in Russia. But we know from analyzing the judicial statistics all over the years that our data is quite close to the reality. Of course, we cannot guarantee that all local protests in Russia were included in our monitoring and data sets, especially taking into account uh, that throughout these years, from 2011 to 2021, a lot of things happened. All the info was uh, uh, quite small at the time, and uh, we just cannot say that we know it all, but we think that we have the most data on the detentions available now. And the data we collected during mass detentions across the country is usually approximate because uh, during the mass detentions, our work uh, becomes into 24 hours, seven, seven days a week. Uh, there are thousands of messages from the people. Some people are released by the police almost immediately. Others are instantly taken away from all means of communication, which prevents us from accurately recording the data. Some people cannot write us. Some people forget that they wrote us and we cannot confirm whether they were detained. We, of course, work with this. We validate and we constantly improve. But uh, we, we know that our data here is approximate, so it's necessary to keep in mind this thing. Yeah, and next slide, please. And uh, what other data do we have on detentions? Uh, from 2021, we began capturing the information about the detentions more detailed. We focus more on the detainees and the circumstances of the detention, including violations committed by the police. So uh, starting from this year, we have data on gender, age, uh, the use of violence during deten detention and other type of violations that were committed by the police or other security forces. Information about the taking away of communications equipment, such as phones uh, or Etc. photography and collection of beer material, whether it was, was forced and how it was forced, and whether the detainee is a journalist, for instance. We plan you to plan publish to this, this, this data later, uh, later on this year, and we are quite open to work together with researchers and share the unpublished data upon requests. Uh, and uh, just last thing to say, we already used some of this data for our various analytical reports, et cetera, but we want to publish this in full. So hope it will be interesting and useful for the researchers and not only for them. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that's all from my side. So I'll pass the floor back. Thank you very much, uh, Daria. Please note that uh, you've got uh, the letter with the, uh, Zoom link to this uh, online seminar. And within this letter, you have the links to what uh, Danny were mentioning. And I think we also, we will also share the presentations from the first seminar and from this seminar because they're full of different uh, useful yes. uh, resources. Would be Thank you. Great. <laughs> cool. We are now turning. <laughs>
we are not turning to the date on uh, criminal uh, political uh, persecution. I would like to pass the word to my colleague, Kegel uh, Dynamo, who will uh, tell us about this uh, data set. Mm -hmm. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. Uh, starting with a bit of history, we started working on a database dedicated to politically motivated criminal reprisals in Russia in somewhere 2014, 2015. Uh, before that, we tried to analyze these reprisals and what we knew about them those days. So we wrote three reports on politically motivated reprisals. And one of them was dedicated to criminal ones. And uh, after that, we also made the first version of the database. And we included uh, there, uh, first of all, the cases that uh, have had been already estimated by uh, some other organizations, uh, such as the Memorial Human Rights Center, uh, the SOVA Center for Information Analysis, Amnesty International, and uh, some other minor uh, initiatives. Mm. We established a website called politpressing.org and published some of our data there. Uh, but recently, as Daniel has already said, we have significantly reworked and updated our database. The data includes over 3,000 items. And this time we took the liberty to estimate some of the cases by ourselves. I will uh, specify it a bit later. Next slide, please. So you see here our objectives to collect data on politically motivated criminal reprisals in contemporary Russia, to make this data accessible and understandable to a wide audience uh, about current state of things and what has happened during the last decade, and to supply data with a convenient toolkit for professional work. We'd like to add only that one of the ideas behind this database was to include and describe cases, uh, not only those that are already described and explained by someone else, but also uh, those that for various reasons are not mentioned by other human rights and analytic organizations, uh, because uh, this way we could show a much bigger and more detailed picture of the politically motivated reprisals, show some trends of, of them in today's Russia. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. Thank you. Uh, here I would like to mention that we include uh, cases uh, instigated by Russian uh, investigative bodies in Russia and in the territory of the Crimea and Sevastopol since Russian investigative bodies and courts have been working there since 2014. And it is also worth mentioning that in this data set, we don't show all the information we have in our data database. Uh, some of the information that we have is sensitive or private, but, and, but some of it can be used later for some other data sets. I guess that Daniel will specify the uh, certain uh, fields of this data set later. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's very important to say how we collect information for our database, speak about our sources, uh, because they are quite different. Uh, first of all, we, in the OBD for uh, monitor different news websites, channels, in Telegram, first of all, and not only, uh, searching for the news on politically motivated criminal cases on a daily basis. Also, and this is maybe one of the most significant parts, we receive information from people themselves. I mean, the people uh, who are charged under such cases, so their relatives or lawyers. Uh, some people are being defended by lawyers cooperating with OVD Info, so we receive information directly from them. Uh, we also monitor the information provided by our colleagues from other human rights organizations and initiatives, of course. And we also search for the information on websites of courts, investigative committees, prosecutors' offices, social networks, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. Uh, so here, uh, a little bit of what I've already mentioned earlier, that, that we still include the cases that have been estimated by other colleagues in our database. Uh, um, first of all, the Memorial Human Rights Center who takes a lot of, spends a lot of time to analyze the, the cases and th quite thoroughly and uh, make a statement on whether a person uh, can be uh, deemed mm -hmm. to be a political prisoner. Uh, also, the Sava uh, center that uh, it's not always it has the materials of the case, but 
it has a, a, a quite limited uh, field where it works about extremist cases, terrorist cases, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, apart from that, and especially since the beginning of the war in February 2022, as the state started to react quite severely to the anti-war protests, and the amount of the politically motivated reprisals has risen significantly, and new articles have appeared, what Daniel has already mentioned, and the older ones have begun to be used more actively, more harshly, and more subtly, so to say, we attempt to represent a bigger picture. So uh, we to take the responsibility to uh, somehow estimate the case as uh, being politically motivated. Of course, we sometimes may not know all the details of the case. Sometimes we even admit that we can be mistaken with our estimation, but still we find this important to mention almost every criminal case that we suppose to consider as politically motivated to present uh, a, a wide picture, as I as already said. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, now on, on the data specifically, uh, so uh, the what kind of cases uh, we consider to be politically motivated, this is partly uh, corresponds with what uh, Daniel uh, spoke in the beginning, uh, but still it, I think it's, uh, uh, it needs to be specified a bit. So first, there are cases initiated in connection with various kinds of anti-war statements, speeches, and actions. Uh, as we spoke, what we discussed uh, on the previous seminar, we also include sometimes uh, the cases that were instigated uh, because of some even radical actions. But uh, uh, here we limited uh, first, uh, we included them when uh, with, with the absence of serious damage and of course damage to, to people as well. And first of all, with the application of disproportionately severe articles of the criminal code. So we know that this time, uh, some minor arsons that were uh, extinguished quite soon with uh, with no real damage can uh, be uh, can be considered as a terrorist attack or sabotage. Uh, the uh, other part is cases direct or indirectly related to the exercise of the right to freedom of assembly, uh, such as participation in a rally or calls for a rally. Uh, of course, uh, if a person didn't uh, use any unjustified violence. Uh, cases initiated under articles that we consider political by definition, that is what Daniel has already uh, mentioned. Uh, cases on extremist activity directly or indirectly related to the activities of the political opposition. Mm, and uh, many other cases that uh, cannot be uh, referred to a big group, but uh, like like those above, but cases in which a political motive can be identified by analyzing the context and the other additional criteria. Uh, by finishing my part, I would like to say that first, it's very important to mention that the information in our database is not full, of course. It's being updated all the time on a daily basis, and not only the brand new information, but also the information on some older cases, because sometimes we find what we uh, didn't know before. And now I'd like to pass the word back to Thank you very much. Um, so the data itself um, available in different formats. First of all, as uh, the flat, uh, big, big, big flat table. At the, at the moment, we have uh, 57 properties uh, described in the first year. We would not go now through all of them, uh, but let me just say that uh, those properties can be divided to several groups. It is data on uh, describing the persecution, describing the persecution, describing the criminal case, preventive measures, uh, sentence, evaluations of uh, the case by uh, different uh, human rights projects and uh, different also helpers to analyze uh, data. By, by helpers, I mean uh, some sort of computed categorization uh, related to the uh, 
age, to the given centers, to the time periods. For example, with uh, uh, with these helpers, you can easily compare uh, data and see the dynamics of um, uh, repression. However, the nature of this data is uh, relational and quite complex. And our attempts to flatten this data inevitably lead to uh, a lot of uh, losses. So <laughs> that's why we decided to publish, um, we developed an experimental um, application programming uh, interface with the uh, object disaggregated data. Uh, it has certain advantages over the flat table, including the uh, uh, actually the availability of more data than uh, the original table. So you can see here uh, different uh, entities which we uh, have in this uh, published part of the database and number of uh, attributes which they have. And uh, this API designed to use for uh, professional uh, purposes, including exposing uh, real-time data. So for instance, we are already using this uh, uh, database in some of our products. Last time we, uh, we were mentioning uh, the, uh, the project which name is repression.info, where we are collecting all the information of the people who are persecuted for anti wars and this data is in real time. Um, again, I would like here to I would like here to draw your attention to the concept of computational uh, notebooks. Uh, it is a sort of a virtual environment, a, mi a mixture of the text and the code, which is uh, executed right inside the manuscript. And so in this presentation, you saw a lot of uh, graphs. And again, I, uh, we sent you the links prior to, to this um, uh, seminar, to this uh, notebooks. Uh, this concept used a lot among scholars to uh, describe different computational methods uh, and give a way to work with uh, supplementary uh, data to different uh, researchers. But more on uh, when you're dealing with the quantitative uh, data. Uh, probably the most known product here is uh, 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 Jupyter Notebooks, which is an interface for computation made with a uh, Python language. In our case, we're using an online data visualization platform Observable. And there, if you, uh, we don't have time now, but if you look if you go through the documentation of this API or through the examples, you, you will see exactly how we are uh, using these APIs to to, um, to build the graphs. And unfortunately, since we just published it, we don't have a lot of examples, but I hope that uh, during the next seminar, we will be able to present you already with the, uh, with the analysis of, um, of the dynamics uh, of uh, repression or uh, or uh, analysis, uh, we, we will compare the repressions place after the full scale war with the period what was before. Uh, now I would like to um, show you some um, graphs describing the contents of this uh, database. So you see that we have a lot of uh, cases here over the past uh, decade. And um, you see that each year they are increasing. There is no 2022 is this. 2022 here is comparably low only because we're discussing today period prior to the uh, full scale invasion. So it's only uh, up until 24th of February. Uh, but in reality, I can say you that uh, even <laughs> okay, we did okay, not okay. yet put into database all the cases from 2022, it's already much, uh, yeah. it's already bigger than 2021. And uh, below you see, uh, you see uh, uh, the uh, uh, distribution of uh, persecutions by subject. Uh, 
so we you see here that uh, we have uh, now databases uh, uh, quite uh, different uh, topics. Um, there is also, a, of course, a regional uh, perspective, and um, I unfortunately we again we have no time. But uh, uh, you 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 if you would start to work with this data, you would immediately see that there's uh, it's not um, oriented uh, towards Moscow and uh, Saint Petersburg. Uh, so uh, again, we are now uh, looking at uh, the period up until 24 February 2022. I guess these graphs uh, changed significantly, but uh, this was uh, distribution by um, uh, the gender and um, by the age of the person at the beginning of the persecution. Uh, the uh, big yellow there, it's, it is data which we don't know, uh, but then there's uh, quite a few cases of uh, minors uh, well, this is uh, yeah probably you don't see that sorry about that but this is the distribution by the uh, of um, persecutions by uh, occupation of the person so it is primarily again until uh, 24 February <laughs> mostly activists uh, then journalists and other persons but I can say to you that nowadays this picture looks completely different and it would be very interesting next time to see how it exactly it's <laughs> changed of course um so this is uh, our top uh, list of uh, criminal um, articles and uh, uh, categorizations of uh, judgments with deprivation of freedom and uh, Again, very interesting topic to compare um, with the uh, current state of uh, things. And um, now, uh, because we don't have a lot of time, I would like to say a few words about the costs of this project. Cost, not financial cost, but the cost, I mean, the resources we put into this project. It might look like uh, another data set, but in the reality it requires constant support. Data search, clarification, fact checking, translation of uh, all uh, evidence, because it is fully translated to English. Um, uh, position of attributes and narratives, uh, development of different tools for the uh, analysis. Only in the last few months, uh, 10 people have been involved in, the, in this uh, project on a regular basis. So we did it every day. But uh, about that, uh, 350 volunteers have been involved in different tasks related to this work only uh, during the last two months. Uh, so far, we have a plan to complement in data for 2022 and 2023. Uh, the data on persecutions unrelated to anti-war stands, because we have a full uh, set of cases which are related, which are anti-war persecutions, but the others we want to complete until uh, next um, seminar. But uh, in general, the future of this project is highly depends. It, it highly depends on the demand on the demand for this uh, data. So lack of interest will, uh, of course, affect the engagement of um, volunteers. That's not what I said. And uh, our own abilities to uh, allocate our internal resources to this project. So yeah, I have to say that uh, demand from you, whatever you journalist or researcher is very, very uh, important to us. We are absolutely open to collaboration and even to customization of this da data to meet uh, uh, specific needs uh, of uh, your research. I don't want to make a lot of promises, but uh, we are very uh, open to, to help. 
And um, just I wanted again to remind that um, we just published this data. But I hope that during the next seminar, we will uh, uh, present already some kind of uh, um, some kind of uh, deep analysis of the dynamics because it is very very difficult questions. I don't know any uh, projects which are really providing the data on how the the, 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 the things are evolving month by month during the last uh two years i know that we are sometimes trying to do something but it is very very difficult because uh, no one actually had this uh, uh, data before so with that i would like to thank you and um, <coughs> thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you.